today on Built to Last. What the railroad giveth, the railroad taketh away. Extending a helping hand. We built it together, supplied the materials. We just showed up with our tools. This is the QML 800. And what the heck is that? Put down your remote, pick up a hammer. It's time for Built to Last. is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and Armstrong Ceilings. Faster, easier, better. Welcome to Built to Last. I'm Monica Peterson. And I'm Mark Nilsson. While carpentry has been around since the dawn of civilization, it's one trade that's never been afraid to embrace the newest and most cutting edge technology. On today's show, we'll visit a place that teaches carpenters how to use new tech on the job. Then we'll learn about two organizations to which carpenters have donated their time, money, and most important, expertise. We'll also check in with Rob North and get an update about Marine Corporal Kyle Moser and his wife, Alex. But first, Metro 59 is a state-of-the-art residential development in beautiful Aurora, Illinois. To make it happen, a lot of different people had to come together. And Monica, when I say a lot, I mean a lot. A lot. Check this story out. <laughs> 35 miles west of Chicago, along the banks of the Fox River, is Aurora, Illinois. Originally a mill town, in 1856, when the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroads established its major railroad repair and construction shops there, it put Aurora on the path to become a manufacturing powerhouse. We have had a history of Phenomenal tradespersons, all kinds of ability to, to develop our community, and that is a key and it's essential to where we have been even from the beginning in the 1850s, 1860s in this community. The largest roundhouse in the U.S. was built there in 1856. Trains were turned around here to head back to Chicago. Generations of workers, 2,000 at one time, built locomotives and rail cars as well as equipment like axles here. It was the largest employer in Aurora for over a hundred years. My great-grandfather and grandfather were employees of the, the Burlington Northern Railroads. All those workers needed housing, they all needed to eat, their children needed schools. The economic engine sparked by the roundhouse and the rail yards made Aurora the second largest city in the state. By the 1960s, the interstate system and commercial air travel began to devastate passenger rail. In 1974, the railroad shut down the roundhouse and machine shops for good, and they fell into disrepair. Amtrak stopped servicing the city in 1985, and Greyhound stopped in 2011. Like so many industrial towns in America, Aurora needed to reinvent and rebuild to overcome the major economic loss of the railroad. Metro 59 is part of an overall development at this point on the Far East Side. What was going to be warehousing and commercial of some type we changed to residential. Because we were seeing what was coming, the I-88 Tech Corridor brought high-tech jobs and new people to the area. We're right near the Route 59 uh, Transit Center. The uh, Metra and, and all of the availability of that was going to make a perfect combination of a, a new development. As the Tech Corridor moved west, so did development towards Aurora, and people got to work. We started our company here in uh, 1998. I started with about six employees and by the year 2004 we were up to 650 employees. The um, residential market, the home market took a dive in 2006 and by the time 2009 rolled around we, the union contractors, had lost basically all of the residential market. The um, economic downturn in our country of uh, most recent uh, past was absolutely devastating uh, to our economy and to many working uh, class folks. 
Due to the economy, the Metro 59 project had to be put on hold for several years. But the town and developers were so dedicated to the project, they restarted it in 2011. Once again, the railroad would be the connecting force for people wanting to live in Aurora. It's called Metro 59 because it's literally walking distance from the Metro. We have tied into the busiest route on the transit system into Chicago. Uh, you see what's happening. You see people wanting to live in, in close proximity to that type of transportation. Metro 59 in Aurora will be built in two phases, encompassing seven five-story residential buildings with 460 units. Phase one consists of hundreds of thousands of construction man hours. They wanted to bring an urban flair to this corridor and bring really what technology was about and how it would translate to younger residences as well as older residents and how we can unify both of them into a single project. And a project of this level, not only do we have the quality standards that must be met, but the consistency standards. Skilled labor provides that as well, allows us to work with a group of individuals that carries it all the way down to the labourship level. Labour uh, involvement in this community is, has always been there and it is just a key to everything that we're doing in regard to our development. It's a partnership. We need each other. That's what's going to inspire growth. And more growth to the west. One stop down the line, downtown Aurora is primed to welcome their new neighbours. When we took over the Roundhouse, we could see that it had immense potential. It's such a cool building, 70,000 square foot building with all kinds of rooms, all kinds of history. Walter Payton had been a part of this. Uh, he brought it back to life. Unfortunately, after he passed, it kind of fell apart. There are a handful of people here that really cared a lot about it and about this town, and they helped us create a new vision for this space. It has a cafe, a restaurant, a brewery, a cocktail bar, a live music venue, a distillery, and four banquet rooms. And probably the best courtyard in Illinois, to be honest with you, in the center of the building. Those people at Metro 59 can hop on that train, they don't need a car, and come one stop west, stop by the Roundhouse, grab a quick beer, head off to the Paramount to watch a great show, or they can head to the casino and uh, have a good time that night. Metro 59 is just an example of how this city has changed. It's improved our community as to what we have to offer to people, why it's good to live in Aurora, why it's a great place to be. We mark that point, we hit the next point. The lasers, before we can get over there, they're pretty much marking where that next point is. We make a mark, we snap a line. At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. Technology is always changing, and the carpenters embrace that. But they never forget a tool is only as effective as the well-trained hands that wield it. Look out over our buzzing cities or down into the palm of your hand. It's clear that we live in an age defined by technological advancement. There isn't a month that goes by where the technology hasn't changed. The students we have coming in, they're used to technology. It's the generation now that's grown up with the video games and the iPhones. 
So for them to come into the training center where they think, okay, I'm gonna learn how to use a saw or a framing square, and then all of a sudden we're showing them a tablet-based twin laser layout system. Routers, uh, electrified door ha hardware, um, a lot of things are going uh, towards uh, being operated from your iPhone. And these technological advancements have become part of the curriculum at the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Apprentice and Training Program for carpenters at the very beginning of their career and in the middle. Doctors have to go back to school, lawyers go back to school, professional carpenters have to go back to school. The thing the school does is they give you advancement classes as far as stuff that you didn't learn in pre-apprenticeship as far as welding, doors and hardware. We have tremendous opportunity for journeymen to come back in to get upgraded, learn the new technology, and learn the different tools, saw stops. This is the Bosch Reacts um, job site table saw. Above and beyond the capabilities of being able to cut large pieces of plywood all the way down to smaller pieces is the precision that it also provides, but the and an additional feature that we added to it is the active response technology. If it detects skin in one millisecond, the blade not only stops immediately, but drops down below the table. The active response system actually is projecting an electric field onto the blade itself. With the electric field that you have in your body, once those fields touch each other, the reaction of the system does activate, and therefore the blade goes below the table itself. Go ahead and try this on. Through technology, a student may be introduced to a new craft with less risk and less waste of materials. Some three or four years ago, we invested in virtual welding. You're going to get comfortable. There you go. And whenever you're ready. It's more muscle memory than anything. It's technique. Once they get the technique down, they're going to become good welders. The computer judges his welding capabilities and suggests what he needs to do in order to improve. This does everything except get the, the rod to stick to the metal. What the virtual welder's doing is saving us about 18,000 pounds of material since we bought the two virtual welders two years ago. All right, gentlemen, this is the QML 800. And you can see on the TV screen, that is our layout. In the carpenter's brave new world, paper is the thing of the past. The union is trying to stay ahead of the curve. They want to, us to be more efficient, more professional. I mean, we definitely teach them to lay out the tried and true regular ways of laying out. And to me, that helps them to get a better understanding when they actually use the technology. I'm going to line it up on my crosshairs in the center of the circle. That right down is the point we want to mark, so go ahead and mark that. Uh, there is uh, lasers that are used for alignment. There are lasers that actually talk to each other and lay out a whole building. We have a radius wall in this blueprint, don't we not? So I'm just going to lay this out. Staking point 42, which is the next one on my radius line. We punch in where the points are located. The dual lasers go to cross the point on that system that's, that's marked out on the uh, tablet. We mark that point, we hit the next point, the lasers, before we can get over there, they're pretty much marking where that next point is. We make a mark, we snap a line. The CRCC has a, a strong commitment towards technology because we have to pr provide the workforce for the contractors. A commitment the union contractors and shops take to heart. I think you have to incorporate technology in business. And uh, you look at where we're at in the United States just in terms of manufacturing. But finding those products that we can produce here in the United States, leveraging technology to not replace shops, but to augment and improve them. There are things that we do and how we make our product now that haven't changed in hundreds of thousands of years, whereas the computer can make a straight line better than any person. It's important to have that precision and to really utilize the expertise and the experience of the craftsman for things that require that extra eye, that attention to detail. So everything we're doing is being designed in CAD three-dimensional models and from there it's going out and starting its life a lot of times on the CNC router. This is automated, it's cutting it precision based on those drawings. I think any time that we've wanted to try something new uh, in terms of technology, the union has never pushed back out of fear that it will replace a job because they've seen that it doesn't. What we've been able to do is have our guys be more effective with technology. Those are experienced tradesmen who have gone through a process, who have learned their skill, who have refined their crafts. And, and that's really, when we have the union label, we're honored to have it on our trucks and on our product because our customers know that it's Kane Miller, it's 1027, and they know that they're getting someone who really knows what they're doing. You got the correct angle there. We definitely feel a lot of pride in our ability to stay ahead of the game with the technology. 
to push our skill set out in the field and basically stay competitive by using technology. Tool technology is always cutting edge. In 1810, Tabitha Babbitt invented a circular saw by attaching a circular blade to her spinning wheel. It's tough to overstate just how much union workers do for their communities. Let's see how they're making a difference in the lives of those who need it most. Any carpenter worth their salt will tell you a ramp cannot stand without proper support. What the trades recognize is that a community, in order to be strong, needs proper support as well. You know, people have the perception that carpenters just pound nails, and we do a lot more than that. We also see ourselves at the, as that positive workforce of helping our communities. A tremendous amount of volunteer, anywhere from wheelchair ramps to fixing people's uh, front doors or things that uh, they have a hard time uh, completing. And that spirit of volunteerism has always been at the heart of organized labor. After World War II, labor was running large-scale community service efforts um, to support their members and to support their entire communities. And eventually, uh, labor ended up consolidating the work they were doing with that of Community Chest, which you might have heard of from the Monopoly game. And Community Chest today is United Way Worldwide. We're really there to leverage the skills and the volunteering that unions and members want to do um, and make sure that we're connecting them with you know, the 200 agencies that United Way works with. That commitment to serving the community has led the Carpenters to work with a number of charitable organizations. Rebuilding Together Metro Chicago is an organization that's been around for 25 years. We have repaired over 1,600 homes in Chicago and Cook County, um, as well as over 200 community facilities. We try to focus on specific neighborhoods from year to year. What we find is um, once we select a neighborhood in which to work, is that there's no shortage of need. Willie and Alfred Parker are longtime residents of the Austin neighborhood. We moved here in 79, and, uh, and we like it here, you know. Mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Parker um, have been a homeowner recipient. They applied for the program, and we were able to find a sponsor, and we did um, quite a bit of work in their house. Well, they noticed I was in a wheelchair, so they decided to build a ramp. The ramp made my life much easier. In 1992, we repaired our first eight homes um, as part of the National Rebuilding Day efforts, and the Carpenters Union were a partner from the beginning. We building together, supplied the materials. We just showed up with our tools. And it's not only the carpenters, we have other trades and other people, college students. We rehabbed a lady's kitchen, new floor, new countertops, new handles on the doors for the kitchen. And it's just everybody working together and helping the owner of the house just improve his, his life and his home and his community. It feels pretty good to go home helping someone out that, uh, you know, can probably doesn't have the money and can't get the stuff done, and it makes you feel good. It helps me, too, as much as it helps him, so it gives me pleasure to do it. Some years I'd get my uh, children to help, to teach them, also to volunteer and help other people. I feel like I fundamentally understand the value that unions have and the incredible ways that union members give back to the community. But what really touches me in this job is when other people realize that. I just want to thank them and I uh, appreciate them coming out and responding as quickly as they did. Our goal really is to not only give them free home repairs, but also make it easy for them to remain in their homes that they've lived in for 30 to 40 years. When I uh, get first get to the job, you meet the, the people, the owner, and you see 
the, the joy in their face. While unions have always been committed to building stronger communities, so has United Way. United Way believes that in order to solve these large-scale problems that our communities face, it really takes bringing everyone to the table um, to both come up with the solutions and to tackle the solutions. And, you know, in the labor movement, we call that solidarity. So whatever we could do as individuals, I mean, why not? Who else is going to do it? So let's get involved. Your home is supposed to be a place of comfort, you know? And imagine living in a house you don't fit in. Stabilo, for over 125 years, has led the industry in measuring and leveling. Still manufactured in Germany since 1865, tradesmen rely on Stabila every day for its precision and durability. We continue to revolutionize the way we build with our lasers, levels, and laser distance measuring tools on commercial and residential job sites around the world. Stabila, how true pros measure. Meet the new family of Blaze Laser Measures from Bosch. Go ahead, turn it on and start measuring. It's that simple. The Blaze family offers a wide range of functions to tackle any measuring job. Extend your reach with accuracy up to a 16th of an inch. With Bluetooth enabled devices, easily transfer measurements to your smartphone or tablet with free Bosch apps. Reach farther, work faster, and stay accurate with the Bosch Blaze family of laser measures. Measure on. In a past episode of Built to Last, we met Kyle Moser, a remarkable young Marine who was injured fighting for our country. Rob North brings us the next chapter in Kyle's story. Thank you, guys. I learned firsthand how difficult it is to reassimilate to civilian life after military service. And that challenge is compounded for injured vets. The Carpenters Union feels a strong commitment to our troops and their families. And that's why they chose to partner with Jared Allen's Homes for Wounded Warriors and lend their skills and labor to building functional housing for wounded vets. As Kyle and Alex Moser rebuild their lives, they're hoping to be selected to receive one of those functional homes. He wanted to stay in the Marines, and then when he figured out, you know, this isn't my life plan anymore, he was like, okay, what do I do next? Man, I'm looking down. What civilian job is similar to his training in the military? We are the Army of God. That he could use that experience towards a civilian job and also enjoy it. My name is Kyle Moser. Would you believe me if I told you I got hit by a meteor? Yeah. I'm a rifleman cross-trained to be a radio operator. So I was on a patrol uh, with my platoon and I was clearing a route and this was the first time out of the entire uh, deployment that I had been sweeping f for, for IEDs. Growing up, wanted to have my own business, you know, lemonade stand sort of thing, just being a little kid selling le lemonade on the street. A best friend of mine who has been in coffee now for five years, he's a barista, he's managed, he's done all sorts of things. And so him and I collaborated and said, look, let's open a coffee shop. And boom, just get blown up. When Kyle first got injured, um, I took a year off of school and I was doing rehab for around five years and it took so long because I had to realize that, you know, I wasn't gonna be able to walk again because it was so painful you know, that I just kind of gave up on it. As Kyle began to heal, Alex returned to school part-time with a generous subsidy from the VA. Moving out here, we thought it would be the same way, but we found out within six months of living here that the VA only covers like 20% of the cost for her to go to school and the 80% we had to cover. And so we found out we owed $16,000 to her school and where was that gonna come from? And so that we had to make a decision whether she was gonna continue to go to college or we were gonna try and make the coffee shop work. I was speaking for the fallen hero. But an opportunity presented itself. The PBS series Mercy Street was casting and a major in Walter Reed passed Kyle's name along. I was able to find out about this role, and I auditioned for it, and I got it. Help me, Chaplain. The doctor has been summoned. Please. You know, this is a life-changing event for me, honestly. You hear those motivational speeches that tell you to go out and 
you know, face your fears. For me, it's like social anxiety, like I'm super self-conscious and everything. And be able to come out here and just do it. And, you know, typically my wife is with me 24-7 and she wasn't able to go with me for the filming. And so you come out here all by myself on a plane and not know anyone and just get through that. And so I do everything by myself. I think people that come from challenging backgrounds in general, I think they have more to say. I think they have more to give. All right, I think they got me going on set. After uh, Mercy Street ended, I wanted to do more acting, but it's just hard to find. Back home, he attended an acting class. I just told him, I'm like, hey, just make sure I can still have kids. And so we're taking fire from the Taliban and like everything. So his adrenaline's going. And so rather than just like, he's just like, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. He may never become an actor, he might. I think, I think it would be tremendous if he does. But never practical, the couple began adjusting to their civilian life. A lot of things that Kyle deals with that are challenging for him, he, you know, keeps to himself. You don't even realize how difficult it is to push yourself in a wheelchair for five minutes until you've tried it. And then not only that, but, you know, fitting through doorways. Your home is supposed to be a place of comfort, you know? And imagine living in a house you don't fit in. The couple applied to Jared Allen's Homes for Wounded Warriors for the chance to receive an adaptive home. When I saw the Jared Allen thing was at our international convention, 2015, they did a presentation on it. We try to create a functional home for our recipients and their families or future families. If you're amputee, if you're paralyzed, if you're blind, or if you have TBI that's debilitating to your daily function of life, you fit our criteria and you fill out an application, there's a uh, high chance that I'll say yes. And then Jared Allen talked at the end of it to everyone there about how uh, he believes in union craftsmen. The UBC has been a just a, literally a lifeline for us, you know what I mean? I mean, it, it started with, you know, a house in Minnesota where we got some labor donated to, you know, being a full-on donor and partners and it, it's been such a good connection and it's so important for us to do these houses when we can with the Carpenters Union. Not just to say thanks to them and, and give them back, but because but, we are a big family. Of all the volunteer projects that we've been involved with, uh, this is one of the best ones. Uh, the unions, uh, unfortunately, in, in today's era, really don't get a positive perception of the good things that unions do. And the union is about brotherly love. I just remember being in the truck with Kyle. We were driving to his dad's house, and he told me, you'll never guess who called me today. We chose Kyle because just so full of life, and uh, you know, that obviously doesn't necessarily come through on, on the paperwork, but when you get to talk to people that know him and you get to talk to him, you, you really understand the guy's ambitions and goals in life, and, and you just want to help him. I feel like having a home just makes it feel like the environment is right for a family to happen. The, the house, I feel like, is just a key to putting all the pieces together. And Alex and I are so grateful for Jared and his family and his organization doing this for us. I feel like the happiness that this house and the freedom and independence that this house will give him, I think it's very well deserved. The Carpenters Union and Jared Allen's Homes for Wounded Warriors celebrate the love and courage that Alex and Kyle share. And that's going to be the foundation of this home. We will continue to follow them as they build their home and continue to rebuild their lives. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. And for all you power tool aficionados, remember, hearing protection is a sound investment. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Thanks for watching. It was a good job.